Hello. From KCRW Santa Monica, I'm Michael Silverblatt, and this is Bookworm. Today, I'm honored to have as my guest W.G. Sebold. Um, he is the author. I will do them in the order of composition rather than the order of their appearance in America, of Vertigo, of The Emigrants, The Rings of Saturn, and now published by Random House, his new novel, Austerlitz. I, I wanted to begin by asking, the prose has the breaths and cadences of poetry, and I wanted to ask, were you influenced by German poetry? Uh, no, not at all by German poetry. The influence came, uh, if from anywhere, from 19th century German prose writing, which also has uh, uh, prosodic rhythms that are very pronounced where prose is more important than, say, social background or plot in any manifest sense. And uh, this uh, 19th century German prose writing, uh, even at the time, was very provincial. It never was received out, outside Germany to any extent worth mentioning. But it's always been very close to me, uh, not least because the writers all hailed from uh, the periphery of the German-speaking lands where I also come from. Among them whom? Adelbert Stifter ah. in Austria, uh, uh, Gottfried Keller in uh, Switzerland. And they are both uh, absolutely wonderful writers who will uh, achieve a very, very high intensity in their prose and where one can see that for them it's never a question you know, to get to the next phase of the plot, but that they devote uh, a great deal of care and attention to each individual, individual page, very much in the way in which a poet has to do. Yes, it, it seems to me that it's like I don't know how to express it correctly. Pastoral philosophy. Mm. I, that's the way yeah. of my reading of Keller yeah. and Stifter. The, the, a, a very, and Heine, too, yes? Well, Heine is there somewhere, though not so much as a prose writer, but Heine, of course, did uh, furnish uh, German writing with uh, new forms of melody that had not been there before. Uh, capable of appealing very, very directly to people's emotions. And, but he was a much more fashionable writer at, at, at his time than the other two were. And Keller was a state official in the canton of Zurich and uh, you know, had led a, a very straight life. But what they all have in com common is uh, this precedence of the uh, carefully composed page of prose over the mechanisms of the novel such as uh, dominated uh, fiction writing elsewhere in France and in England, notably, at that time. Now, when I started reading The Emigrants, I was thrilled to encounter a kind of sentence that I had thought people had stopped being able to write. Mm. And I felt great relief mm. at its um, gravity, its melancholy, but also its playfulness, its generosity. And I, and I wondered, did it take... How did you find the way to reinvent such a sentence? It's not of this time. It's not of this time. I mean, there are um, hypotactical syntax forms in these sentences which uh, have been abandoned by practically all the writers now for reasons of convenience also because simply they are no longer accustomed to it. But if you dip into any form of 18th or 19th century discursive prose, or the English essayists, for instance, these forms exist in, 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 in previous uh, uh, ages of, of, of literature. And uh, they simply have fallen into disrepair. The wandering that the prose does, both syntactically and in terms of subjects, reminds me a bit of my favorite of the English essayist, De Quincey. Mm -hmm. um, the, the need, in a sense, to almost sleepwalk, sonambulate mm -hmm. from one center of mm -hmm. attention mm -hmm. to another, and a feeling in the reader 
that one has hallucinated mm. the right. um, connection between the mm. parts. Yeah. This, I think, is among the loveliest qualities, especially mm. in the new book, Austerlitz. Mm. Mm. Well, certainly. I mean, it is, you know, moving from one subject, from one theme, from one concern to another always requires some kind of sleight of hand. I was struck um, in the opening of Austerlitz by the way in which the narrator moves from a, a zoo, from a, uh, what is it called? Noct- the Noctorama. The Noctorama. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a structure for animals <clears throat> that are awake only at night. And before long, the train station to which he returns becomes the double for the zoo. The eyes of certain thinkers become the doubles for the intense eyes of the nocturnal animals. Then the train station recalls a fortress, Mm. and there's a gradual opening out and unfolding Mm -hmm. of structures and interpositions. The speaker might well be the person spoken to by Mm. virtue of this logic. And it extends with, it seems to me, an invisible referent that as we go from the zoo to the train station, from the train station to the fortress, from the fortress to the jail, to the insane asylum, Mm. that the missing term is the concentration camp. Mm. And that always circling is this silent presence Mm being left out but always gestured toward. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, I mean, that corresponds, your description corresponds very much to, to, to my intentions. I've always felt that it was necessary above all to write about uh, the history of persecution, of vilification of minorities, the uh, attempt well nigh achieved to eradicate a whole people. And uh, I was in pursuing these ideas at the same time conscious that it's practically impossible to do this, to write about concentration camps, in my view, is practically impossible. So you need to find uh, ways of convincing the reader that this is something that is on your mind. Uh, but that you do not necessarily roll out you know, uh, uh, you know, on every other page. But the, the re- reader needs to be prompted that the narrator has a conscience and that he is and has been perhaps for a long time engaged with these questions. And uh, this is why you know, the, the, the main scenes of horror are never directly addressed. I think it is sufficient to remind people because we've all seen images, uh, but these images militate against our capacity for discursive thinking, for uh, uh, reflecting upon these things, and also paralyze, as it were, our moral capacity. So the only way in which one can approach these things, in, 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 in my view, is obliquely, tangentially, by uh, by reference rather than by direct confrontation. Now, it seems to me, though, that in addition, that it is the invisible subject. As one reads the book and one watches um, moths dying or many of the images... One, it's almost as if this has become a poem of an invisible subject, mm-hmm. all of whose images refer back to it, mm. a metaphor that has no statement of its ground, mm. only of its vehicle, as they used mm. to say. Yes, precisely. I mean, you know, there is this uh, probably known better to you than... Then to me, um, Virginia Woolf, the wonderful example of her description of a moth uh, coming to its end on a window pane somewhere in Sussex. And this is a passage of some two pages only, I think, and it's written somewhere, chronologically speaking, between the battlefields of the Somme 
and the concentration camps erected by my compatriots. And uh, you know, there's no reference made to the battlefields of the Somme in this passage. But one knows, uh, as a reader of Virginia Woolf, that she uh, was greatly perturb perturbed by, by the First World War, by, by its aftermath, by the damage it did to people's souls, the souls of those who got away and naturally of those who perished. So, you know, I, I, I think that uh, a subject which at first glance seems quite far removed from, from the undeclared concern of a book can uh, encapsulate that concern. I'm speaking to W.G. Sebald. Will, will you pardon me? I don't know your name. Yeah, well, I'm generally called Max. Uh, uh, people. Very pleased to meet you. Um, who is, to my mind, um, not only the most interesting European writer, he is one of the great world writers writing today. Um, you're listening to Bookworm, and I'm Michael Silverblatt. His new book is Austerlitz, published by Random House. Now, I notice in the work, in particular in The Rings of Saturn and in the new book, the tradition of, of the walker. I, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Rousseau's Reveries of a Solitary mm. Walker. And thinking, too, that it was once beautifully common for a prose writer to write what he sees mm -hmm. on his walk. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, the naturalist Louis Agassiz said that Thoreau used to sometimes bring things mm -hmm. to him mm -hmm. in the um, laboratory at Harvard, and the, the things that Thoreau picked up by accident mm -hmm. were never less than unique. Mm -hmm. It was necessary for mm -hmm. a writer to develop an eye. And it seems to me, to my ear, that the rhythms here have to do a great deal with the writing of entomologists and naturalists. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's the study of nature in, in, in all its forms. I mean, the Walker's approach to viewing nature is a phenomenological one, and uh, the uh, scientist's approach is a much more incisive one. But they all belong together. And in my view, even today it is true that science scientists very frequently write better than novelists. And so I tend to read uh, scientists uh, by preference almost, and I've always found them uh, a great source of inspiration. And uh, it doesn't matter particularly whether they're 18th century scientists or it's uh, Humboldt or uh, someone uh, contemporary like uh, Rupert Sheldrake. Uh, these are all very close to me and uh, people without whom I couldn't pursue my work. It seems to me even more so than in the other books, there is a ghostly prose here, um, dust-laden, mist-laden, penetrated by odd and misdirecting lights that the that the attempt here is really to become lost in a, a fog. Yes, well, in, in these kinds of natural phenomena like fog, like mist, uh, which render the environment and one's ability to see it, uh, uh, all, all, all render this almost impossible. There are always phenomena that interested me greatly. I mean, I, one of the great strokes of genius in standard 19th century fiction, I always thought, was the fog in Bleak House. You know? Oh, yes. And uh, it's... Uh, this ability to, to make uh, of one natural phenomenon a thread that runs through a whole text and, 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 and kind of upholds this, uh, this extended metaphor is something that I've, I find very, very attractive in the writer. Yeah. It seems to me that in this book, it's truly the first to pay extended stylistic respects to the writer who it's been said to me has been your mentor and model, Thomas Bernhardt. Mm -hmm. And I, I wondered, was it after three books that one felt comfortable in creating a work that could be compared 
to the writing of a master and a mentor? Yes, I, I, it, I was always, as it were, tempted to declare openly from quite early on my great debt of gratitude to Thomas Bernhard. But uh, I was also conscious of the fact that one oughtn't to do that too openly because then immediately one gets as put in, in a drawer which says uh, Thomas Bernhardt, uh, a follower of Thomas Bernhardt, etc. And uh, these labels never go away. Once one has them, they, they stay with one. But nevertheless, I, it was... Uh, necessary for me eventually to to acknowledge uh, his constant presence, as it were, by my side. What Thomas Bernhardt did to uh, post-war fiction writing in the German language was to bring to it a new radicality which uh, didn't exist Mm. before, uh, which wasn't compromised in any sense. Much of German prose fiction writing of the 50s certainly, but of the 60s and 70s also is severely compromised. And because of morally compromised and because of that aesthetically frequently insufficient. And Thomas Bernhard was in quite a different league because he occupied a position which was absolute, uh, which had to do with the fact that he was mortally ill since uh, you know, late adolescence and knew that uh, you know, any day the knock could come at the door. And so he took the liberty which other writers shied away from taking. And what he what he achieved, I think, was also to move away from from the standard pattern of the standard novel. He only tells you in his books what he heard from others. So he invented, as it were, a kind of Paris, uh, periscopic form of narrative. So you're always sh- sure, you know, what that what he tells you is related at one remove, at two removes, at two or three. And that appealed to me, to me very much because uh, this notion of the omniscient uh, narrator who pushes around the flats on the stage of the novel you know, and cranks things up uh, on page three and uh, moves them along on page four and one sees him constantly working behind the scene is something that uh, I think one can't do very easily any longer. So Bernhardt uh, single-handedly, I think, invented a new form of narrating, which uh, appealed to me from the start. It's not only a new form of narrating. It's a new form of making things stop in space Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. the Bernhardt works are often composed in one long paragraph, Mm -hmm. sometimes in one long sentence, Mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. And the effect is of a dream, of Mm. being spoken to in a dream, and your attention can't help but flicker in and out. Mm. Um, You you can move back a page or two and discover Mm. the very careful links of the chain that Mm. you've... But the intensity has been so nonstop Mm. that it's almost as if it breaks the mind's Mm. attempt Mm. to hold it in a chain. It is that. It is. I mean, uh, Bernhard's mode of of telling a tale is related to all manner of things. I mean, not least the theatrical monologue in the uh, early book uh, that bears the English title Gargoyles and in German is called Die Verstörung. The second, the whole of the second part of that is... uh, the monologue of the Prince of Saurau, and it would make a wonderful piece on the stage. So it has the intensity of the presence, the presence that one can experience in the theater, and he brings that to fiction. Now, I've been very amused because critics or writers about your work in America seem to be bewildered by its tone Mm. And I don't, in fact, find its tone bewildering. Mm. I think they are unfamiliar with it because it's tenderness. Mm. And it's tenderness brought to bear on subjects that have usually compelled indignation, um, scorn, and certainly in Beckett and in Bernhardt, a huge and glittering kind of contempt or Mm -hmm. uh, or scorn. Here, it really 
has that quality of, am, am I wrong here, of infinite care taken to listening to speakers who are not being reviled in the slightest, really. Yeah, I mean, this is something I, I don't know where it quite comes from, but I do like to uh, listen to people who have been sidelined for one reason or another. Because in my experience, once they begin to talk, they have to tell you, they have things to tell you that you won't be able to get from anywhere else. And I felt that need of being able to listen to people telling me things from very early on, not least, I think, because I grew up in post-war Germany where there was, I say that quite often, something like a cons conspiracy of silence, i.e., you know, your parents never told you anything about their experiences because there was, at the very least, a great deal of shame attached to these experiences. So one kept them under lock and seal. And I, for one, doubt, you know, that uh, my mother and father, even amongst themselves, ever, you know, broached any of these subjects. And there wasn't a written or a uh, spoken agreement about these things. It was a tacit agreement. It was something that was never touched on. So I've always, I've grown up feeling, you know, that there is some sort of emptiness somewhere that needs to be filled by accounts from witnesses one can trust. And once I, you know, started, uh, and I would never have encountered these witnesses if I hadn't left my native country at the age of 20. Because the people who could tell you the truth as, you know, or something at least approximating the truth did not exist in that country any longer, but one could find them in Manchester and in Leeds or in North London or in Paris uh, or in various places in Belgium and so on. Because I, I find it almost spooky how frequently, I guess, it, expecting the austerities and harshnesses of certain post-war prose... They don't, these critics, mm. seem to see that this is characterized by tenderness, bewilderment, horror, infinite, it seems to me, pity, mm -hmm. and a kind of almost willed self-mortification that the, the, you know, that I am willing to hear and place great acts of attention on all things with the chance and hope that revelation will occur. Mm. Well, <clears throat> I suppose, uh, you know, if there is such a thing uh, as a revelation, if uh, there can be a moment in a text which is surrounded by something like claritas, veritas, uh, uh, and the other facets that qualify epiphanies, then it can uh, be achieved only by actually going to certain places, by looking, by uh, uh, expending great, amount, great amounts of time in, in, in actually uh, exposing oneself to uh, places that no one else goes to. These can be backyards in cities. They can be places like that fortress of Brindonk in that particular book. I had read about Brindonk uh, before in connection with uh, Jean Améry, but the difference is staggering, you know, whether you, you just read about it or whether you actually go and um, spend several days in and around there to see what these things are actually like. Because if you will pardon me, I think that your radical contribution to prose, mm. it was once explained to me that there was in German prose something called das Glück im Winkel, mm -hmm. happiness mm -hmm. in a corner. Mm -hmm. And to bring, it seems to me, the sensibility of tininess, miniaturization, but to the enormity mm. of the post-concentration camp world, mm. Mm. that what is happening here is that 
a completely or nearly forgotten prose tone is being brought into mm. the postmodern century mm. and that the extraordinary echo, almost the immediate abyss that opens mm. between the prose mm. and the subject, mm. is what happens that automatically ghosts, echoes, mm. trance states. It's almost as if you are allowing the world to howl into mm. Mm. the seashell of this prose style. Mm. Yeah. Well, it, uh, you know, uh, I think Benjamin at one point says that there is no point in exaggerating that which is already horrific. And from that, by uh, extrapolation, one could conclude that perhaps in order to get the full measure of the horrific. One needs uh, to remind the reader of beatific moments of life uh, because if you, uh, as it were, existed solely with your imagination in le monde concentrationnaire, then you would uh, somehow not be able to sense it. And so it requires that contrast and the contrast is, uh, and the old-fashionedness of the diction or of the narrative tone is therefore nothing to do with nostalgia for a better age that's gone past, but it is simply something that, as it were, heightens uh, the awareness of that which we have managed to engineer in this century. I've been speaking to W.G. Sabold, Max Sable, the author most recently of Austerlitz and of some of, it seems to me, the most important prose writing of our century, including the novels Vertigo, The Emigrants, The Rings of Saturn, and now, as I've said, Austerlitz, published by Random House. Thank you very much for speaking with Thank me. Thank you. You can read the first chapter of Austerlitz on the bookworm page at kcrw.com. My associate producer is Melinda Siegel. The engineer is Reg Warna. Special production assistance from Alan Howard. I'm Michael Silverblatt. Join me again next week on Bookworm.